Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Open Source and Business. This is a series where we, I, I have a set of interviews where I interview really kind of interesting people about different aspects of the impact of open source across uh, the industry. And this week, I'm joined by Pia Mancini and uh, Luis Villa. Um, Pia is the founder and CEO, is that right, of Open Collective? That's right. And uh, Luis is the founder, uh, is a founder and general counsel of Tidelift. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, what I've titled maintaining the middle, um, which we'll get into what I mean by that. But there's a, a there are a set of critical open source projects that have a, a long term sustainability, a long term maintenance challenge. We're going to talk about that challenge. We're going to talk about some of the approaches that that uh, companies like Tidelift and Open Collective have brought to the table to uh, address that challenge. Um, so uh, Pia, can you introduce quickly um, Open Collective? You know, how did Open Collective get started and, and what is your general thinking, your general approach to this issue? Yeah, so um, Open Collective started, um, and I'm one of three co-founders um, uh, of Open Collective. Um, and we started five years ago. Um, well, we started Open Collective um, because we saw um, like a big hole that the internet had left that is the following um, communities um, are use you know use the internet to connect to collaborate to share um, they come online they're distributed uh, they can generate um, you know products creativity together but the big problem that they have is that they cannot get funding because the system that we have is set up for corporations um, and corporations speak to corporations. And so corporations understand talking to another corporation, giving money to another corporation, whether that's for profit or non-profit, but they understand that. They also understand the individual, like the freelancer contractor. What they don't understand is how to give money to a community that is not incorporated, right? That doesn't have a legal entity. That is just a bunch of people coming together to create something that they are not incorporated in any territory. They don't have any formal organization. And we saw open source, obviously, as one of the main ecosystems who suffers from this because open source maintainers are, you know, scattered around the world. They're doing their thing. Um, and more often than not, they're not incorporated as a legal entity. And so on the one hand, you had all of these incredible communities producing software, producing, you know, sharing the result of their creativity and ingenuity. And on the other side, you have companies um, who use that uh, product of the um, of the maintainers kind of creativity in their stack um, and they want to support these communities but they have a very clear blocker that is they can't send the money to these communities because they are not a thing that exists that a corporation can talk to so open collective set out to solve this problem we wanted to enable communities open source communities to unlock and have access to economic power by giving them a platform that they can use to have a minimal organizational structure um, that is paired with an umbrella organization that is the open source collective that is a non-for-profit that acts as custodians of that um, money so essentially the open source collective interfaces with um, companies foundations and individuals in the name of the open source project to scale up and enable project directed funding. Um, that's so what you, we do. Would you, would you characterize yourself as um, a fiscal sponsor similar to the Software Freedom Conservancy or? So the open source collective is a fiscal sponsor. Um, it's essentially it's a league of business. It's a mutual benefit corporation um, whose um, sole goal is to bring forward the health and sustainability of the open source ecosystem. So it's a very broad, um, corporation, non-for-profit um, organization. Um, but the open source collective is paired with the open collective platform, right? That is an open finances and transparent um, management, financial, financial management platform that enables projects to have somewhere where they become something. They become a collective, they can receive money, they can manage their money, they can spend money. So it's okay. the combination of the platform plus the fiscal sponsor that really enabled us to kind of scale um, the way we did. So I'm curious, and, and I should have done my research beforehand, but I'm curious whether right. um, the being present on the platform is is different from being kind of a directed fund in a in a nonprofit in the way that like 
the Linux Foundation or Software Freedom Conservancy has directed funds? Um, so they have those two examples. Um, they provide other things that we don't. So they provide legal advice, they hold trademarks, although we're now doing that. Like our main goal is to solve the financial bit of all of this. Like the money is not going to the open source collective for the open source collective to use to support JavaScript, right? Or any other language is going directly to a certain project for the project to decide how they spend that money. So it's really the only thing that we are doing is we're enabling project to have a budget that they can um, they can use to support their work. Okay, thank you, Luis. Um, you and I have known each other for quite a while. <laughs> I think it's fair to say. But um, can you tell me a little bit about Tidelift and how Tidelift got started a few years ago and, and what your goal is and how you see the how you see this problem and how you've approached it perhaps a little bit differently to uh, the Open Collective? I think it's very complementary to what Open Collective is doing. I mean, we, we so very much agreed on this problem of companies knowing how to interface with other companies, right? Uh, and so, you know, we saw a, a very related facet of that, which is that companies often uh, are really attached to what's the value I'm getting out of this. Uh, and uh, charity based approaches, um, Dave, I don't, we promised we wouldn't reminisce uh, too much together, but, <laughs> uh, you know, we were definitely involved in GNOME at the same time. And a key challenge that GNOME had in the early days. Uh, and also one of my co-founders, Havoc, uh, also very involved in GNOME, was on the board. Uh, and key challenge that we kept seeing throughout our careers was um, how do you convince these corporations that there's value to be had, right? And among other things, one of the things that is very helpful in that is having a sales team. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, so the legal structure that Pia was talking about is very much part of that. Um, but it's not just the structure. It's also what's the productized, and it, it, this makes me sound like such an MBA type, right? But it, but it's very real, uh, is this, you know, what, what's the productizable value that you can sort of package all this together and say, hey, this is a thing that you should not just use, but you should buy. Because those are similar, but not quite the same kinds of things, especially in our space. Right, right. Uh, where so much of use means just I don't know I just downloaded it off the internet, right? Um, and so, you know, Tidelift's proposition is, for buyers is that we package together a lot of developers, a lot of maintainers, and put that information and that reliability together into one package that you can essentially obtain, right? And on the flip side, for maintainers. Uh, involvement is you know, financial, as, as Pia was calling out, uh, but critically, and this is something I know that uh, Open Collective is also working on, is this question of, and is related to the theme today of the middle, which is that you can have, you know, Linux Foundation has, they don't call it a sales team, but has a very effective sales team, right, that goes and says, hey, these top projects the, that you interface with all the time, like Kubernetes, you should give millions of dollars at a time to it. And down at the bottom of the stack, there's, I'm trying to make sure my fingers are on screen here, uh, the, the, there's you know Red Hat uh, or AWS, there's folks who are very happy to sell you the core operating system at various price points. But then there's that big middle uh, that is traditionally very neglected, right? When I talk to CTOs, I was like, well, so, you know, tell me the, you know, tell me the projects that you think about every day. And they're like, oh, you know, Kubernetes or OpenShift. Or, okay, well, tell me which project last caused a crippling vulnerability. In, had you ever heard of that project before it caused a crippling vulnerability in your stack? And they're always like, mm, no, no, I'd never heard of it until then. But you've been using it for years, yeah? Mm, yeah. So why are you paying, like, so the relative amount of attention and money paid to the top and bottom of the stack versus where the, uh, you know, where a lot of the issues are in, in a modern software stack um, is disproportionate, right? And so we have modeled our uh, model from the beginning on payments that are not just to those high profile projects, but that, uh, you know, that flow down 
through your entire stack, right? You cannot from Tidelift buy support for just one project. You have to buy support for that project plus all of its dependencies. Like that's sort of a core tenet of, uh, of who we are and what we do. So Rising tide, about... lifting all boats, corny, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I like it, I, and I got it immediately. That was a, that was a, a nice uh, a nice nice catch actually in terms of a name. It was good. Um, but let's talk about the maintaining the middle. So what, when I was thinking about the middle, what I was thinking of is there's a, a lot of basic infrastructure. You mentioned the operating system, but even I would include Kubernetes in the bottom that you can you can go to a vendor and get support for. Um, and then you've got the code that you write on top, which you're on the hook for. And in the middle, I thought of things like uh, programming languages or uh, JavaScript frameworks or PHP modules, um, you know, CSS that you download off the internet, all of this stuff that makes up your application. And I, there's a reason why I'm kind of focusing on web applications there, because that seems to be uh, one of the major pieces of the stack that that suffers from this problem most. I mean, we mm -hmm. saw a Babel uh, blog post about Babel's used by millions. Uh, why is it why is it suffering from why why don't we have more money? I'm mischaracterizing. But uh, Babel is used by by millions. Uh, so why are we running out of money? It's, oh, it wasn't that far off. Um, but there's, there's all of these projects that make up applications that are in the middle. Um, so I was thinking of it in that. It's like you're on the hook for your own code. You can buy vendor support for core libraries and operating system and, and hypervisor platform. Uh, but all of your application stuff is, you know, you're basically self-supporting because the way that developers consume that is they download it off the internet and they use it. And um, So do you think there's a, a kind of an unhealthy freeloading culture? I mean, freeloading is a word that I don't like to use very much mm. because it has connotations of companies using free software uh, consistent with the license and then the developers who are typically companies uh, saying, you know, we should get more money from, from this. But in, yeah. in terms of web development, it's a lot of these projects are community maintained. Things like Babel or Vue.js, uh, React, um, although React's not a good example. But um, is there a particularly, in, a, in the web stack, is there a particularly uh, unhealthy culture of freeloading? And how, like, how do you respectively approach that? Um, I don't know if I would call it freeloading. I agree with your assessment of the word. But I think there are imbalances. There are definitely a lot of imbalances. Um, so on the one hand, you have a lot of people using software. Um, it's free to download and use. Um, it's free to open an issue. It's free to request something, right? You have, you're not penalized for um, adding burden um, to the community that is developing uh, a software. So that there's an imbalance. And on the other hand, you have, um, you know, few maintainers um, who are doing um, the less glamorous work of maintaining something um, and less glamorous um, as opposed to creating something new, right? There's always more people interested in like doing something new and, you know, testing a new way of, you know, doing something. Um, but then those who are stuck with maintaining something they did a couple of years back, right? That's tough. Um, it's tough for a company. Look, inside Open Collective, we are, you know, we always struggle with how many new features are we going to do now? Because we know we are going to have to maintain them. And we're ready, you know, every time we add something, imagine for a community of unpaid volunteers, <laughs> right? And so I would say there is a big imbalance in, in the community. So that's how I think about it. So when the framework I use to think about this is how we can make it more balanced, right? So um, it's very, it's, you the, the complicated part of that i guess um and tidelift is thinking about this in in one way um is how do you create something that is scarce how do you create scarcity in an ecosystem um that the the result of your work you can't make it scarce right because it's accessible by anyone because it's the nature of what you're doing right it's open for anyone to use right so so what is the one thing that you can build scarcity around and that's maintainers time, right? So for example, we've seen projects that 
if you want to open an issue, if you want your issue to be read, you need to be a sponsor. You need to be giving them funding. If you want your pull request to be reviewed, you need to be a sponsor of the community because otherwise, so, you know, you have a lot of imbalances. It's very cheap, it's free to open an issue. It takes a lot of time for a maintainer to review, close, triage those issues, right? Luis? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, I actually wanna, so uh, and I, I think, yeah, I guess in the introduction you mentioned I'm the general counsel. So I'm a former programmer turned attorney uh, I, I, and a former open source developer turned attorney very much with the idea of like, I'm going to use open source licenses for good. So here, uh, I'm gonna say the same thing again in a podcast in like two hours. And we have a conference coming up called Upstream where I will be doing a panel and I will say basically exactly the same thing, which is that if all you're doing is complying with the license, that's just like, that is not enough, right? Like following the letter of the law is very different from having a healthy relationship to a community. Uh, and you know, anybody like I, I, I have the same concerns about the word freeloading, but you then tied it specifically to license. And I think we have made a very bad mistake over the past 20 years of centralizing the licenses, right? When the licenses were not the magic here, right? The magic, uh, is very much the communities, right? Like the actual people and the actual time. And the license is like a, you know, friction, you know, it's a friction reducer. It reduces certain barriers to entry. And like, and I've spent way too much time of my life writing licenses to like completely throw them out the window, but uh, it's not where I would start with the analysis, right? The analysis of very much as Pew is saying, goes to questions of time, uh, questions of perceived fairness, uh, there's a um, uh, famous economist, Nobel Prize winning economist named Eleanor Ostrom, who uh, spent her career working on studying uh, commons based production. As I, you know, imagine like, you know, sheep herders who shared a, a, a field or farmers who shared a water source. Uh, she and her grad students surveyed something like 970, 930, and I don't remember the exact number, uh, of, uh, of naturally occurring long-term, you know, multi-generational sustainable uh, commons. And they all had, all of them, had some kind of exclusionary principle, had some kind of like, you're either in or you're out uh, rule, right? So she has a bunch of different things that were observed across uh, most of those, and that's one of the few that was present in all of them. And so I don't, you know, freeloading, free riding, very much a loaded term. And yet there's a pretty natural human instinct towards having that sense of, of in and out. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we thought we could get away with it. I think there's actually a really interesting paper to be written about how, um, open source confounds Ostrom in some good ways, right? Like there are some reasons because in fact, the cost of the thing is zero, more or less. We'll, we'll put the question of time to the side for a second, right? But the good is is cost zero and, uh, or in economist terms, zero marginal costs. And, you know, so there's some interesting things, but but it just sticks with me that core intuition that like, it's okay. And in fact, very natural to say, you know, some people are in, some people are out. And I think, you know, what Pia is saying, I think we're gonna see more and more of this kind of thing of, uh, you know, pay to, you know, pay to get your issues read, especially around issues, right? Pull requests are a little more fraught for a whole bunch of, you know, good reasons, right? But the other thing I, I wanted to say, Dave, is I want to push back on this notion that this is just a web uh, problem, because I think this is a problem with all of the modern package managed languages. Right, because they all sort of by design encourage, uh, you know, s smaller and smaller segmentation. So we see this as well. You know, Python. Uh, you can't write a hello world in Python these days. With I mean, you can, but like, uh, you have to work at it to write a hello world that doesn't download dozens of dependencies whose you know names. I, I actually, you know, this would be a really interesting thing that 
is is really weird for you and I for like people of our generation because there's definitely generational factors here. Um, we have so like when we were first starting to do this, right? Like, oh well, one of the things that we'll do is we'll encourage maintainer. You know, maintainers will put like a tide lift banner on their site, and that will like you know encourage people to piles of these middle projects don't have websites. Nobody, yeah, nobody right? ever visits but, the website if they do, right? It's right, because they're right. they're installed by the package managers that pull down a dependency from exactly you know, yeah there, there's no like artisanal crafting of your stack right like it used to be like oh yeah i visited the website and i looked and see i looked to see how well maintained it was and it looked like these people are really on top of things like no you just is it in the package manager is it a dependency of something else that you want to use done right and that's like Simultaneously, like it actually does reduce some of your maintenance burdens, right? If people aren't interacting with you, eh. um, but it also at the same time makes you sort of anonymous. And you know, that's certainly part of why we think that flow down uh, is, is really critical because just because people aren't interacting with you doesn't mean you're not a source of security vulnerabilities, right. uh, you know, problems with, uh, you know, resale, I keep telling people that if I wanted to retire right now, I'd buy a bunch of uh, permissively licensed JavaScript libraries and uh, then go around enforcing their the attribution requirements of their licenses. <laughs> and there's we've had this conversation where there's like there's a healthy industry of uh, uh, people who are volunteering to take over essentially unmaintained JavaScript libraries and then um, you know creating a ransomware. <laughs> model of you know in, inserting vulnerabilities and then charging people to get them fixed right or something similar to that i mean we don't know how healthy that is i think one of the one of the habits that i try to stay away from and i'm sure pia does as well you know and actually pia i'd love to hear your thoughts on this is that there's this balance of like telling people hey stuff is unmaintained you should be worried but also like not trash talking open source, right? Like you, where there's this constant balance. You don't want to be an asshole and you don't want to exaggerate the problems. Right. It's also, uh, absolutely, it's also stuff. I, you know, if, I, if you remember that Dominic Tarr's, um, you know, project that the one that had someone taking over and injecting a malware in the payload or something, right? To steal Bitcoin or something like that. I remember exactly what it was. Um, and it was a project that, you know, Dominic, it's just, it's very tough because what are you gonna say? Like you have the security vulnerability and he's like, great, I haven't used that in years. I've moved on to other projects, which I think are much more interesting. I don't even agree with that way of doing things. Why am I on the hook for maintaining this? Because, you know, 2 million applications are using it or 6 million, I don't know what it was, was something outrageous. So, um, so, so yes, there has to be a balance. I, I the first sustain, I think, what you know, one of the one of the kind of, I guess, insights that we took, uh, we called it free the maintainer, right? We need to find a way of also freeing the maintainer for work that they had, they you know, put out there in the past, and they don't particularly want to, you know, still be involved in. Um, and we as a community need to decide how do we, what do we do with these projects? It's not fair. That it, the the burden of solving this is on the maintainer. I don't think it's fair for someone to go in and tell you know Dominic, hey, you have a security issue, fix it because all of these people depend on you. Yeah. You know? So it's interesting. Yeah, that, I think um, we used both to. You, I, I just I want to drill down on something that both of you have touched on here, which is um, that the burden is related to how many people are using the software. Mm -hmm. And the people who are using the software who come to depend on the software are not necessarily the people who are writing the software they come to depend on, in yeah. some cases. And if you look at projects like Babel, a good, a good example. Uh, it's pulled in as a dependency by other JavaScript frameworks. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Babel is a dependency is completely opaque to the people who are developing these web applications with the frameworks that use it. Um, so how do you... Like, I, I guess this is, uh, uh, Luis, something that's particularly relevant for Tidelift. How do you how do you craft a value proposition around a dependency of a framework that somebody doesn't even know they have as a dependency? And they're, like, if you're just using a website, you're not necessarily the person who's 
financially motivated to fix a dependency in the JavaScript library, as an example. But um, the, the people who are developing the websites are, but maybe are not even aware that that's kind of in there. I, I'm and going off on a tangent here, but uh, like if there's if there are these layers of opacity between the thing that causes a problem and the people who actually get value from the use of the library, um, how do you how do you craft a value proposition around that? How do you identify the people that are going to pay? That's the, I guess, the critical issue. Well, I mean, <clears throat> certainly part of the how do you identify who pays is in part traditional, uh, you know, uh, boring but critical enterprise sales work, right? Um, I have a blog post that I really need to finish and get out about why I enjoy, uh, why I actually enjoy working with our sales team. And, um, you know, and, and part of it is simply that they are good at identifying who has these pots of money and who is worried about their infrastructure, right? Because they're definitely, look, you know, I've had friends from startups come to us and be like, you know, Lewis, you're, you, you know, I want to, I want to support your company. Like how do, how do I do that? And like, look, when you're running on a shoestring, yeah, get this stuff for free. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, your your bigger concerns are not like whether some, you know, whether statistically speaking, one of your dependencies is going to get Bitcoin wallet ransomware in like three to five years. Your startup, you're thinking about three to six months out. Right. But there are these other institutions that think decades out. Uh, and so identifying, you know, our approach has been to start from those or those kinds of organizations that are more sophisticated in their thinking about long term software ecosystems uh, and really uh, and work with them. Right. Like that's that's been our sort of foothold. And we would, of course, love to over time, uh, you know, package more of that up in ways that make sense for startups. Right. And I'm sure, you know, we've certainly got some ideas on, on the roadmap for that. Uh, but that's like a big differentiator is understanding like who are those in the past we used to I, I, in many ways we still do call them sort of legacy software users right but they are they're you know in some ways they move slow but often they move slow for very good reasons and so that's a big so they are used to thinking more about these kinds of implications in the long run mm -hmm. so i think that's you know the other thing is that i would say that beyond what um you know, he was talking about making time scarce there's also, I think, making metadata scarce, right? right? Like this is a sort of underplayed thing, yeah. but like so much of, I mean, there's a huge business around, uh, uh, around essentially what are even the licenses of the things that I, <laughs> that, that I use. Uh, and that's a sort of unintentional scarcity, right? Like actually well, uh, robust licensing information is actually scarce. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, how, how you fix, there are ways you can fix that. I, I, a personal irritation, if I can get just cranky for a brief second, is all of the people in the industry who want maintainers to do perfect license information rather than work on their software. Yeah. Right. And they want them to work on that perfect license information for free and when it benefits exclusively gigantic companies. Yeah, it's interesting. That's actually GitHub sponsors play, right? GitHub sponsors when they do sponsors, not individual, but companies is a subscription to a project against, you know, ac better access to the metadata of that project. That is a little known fact. It's something that they didn't disclose a lot, but you know, that's, that's the, that's, that's the play, I think. And I think that makes sense. To be honest, I think that you need to create scarcity and you're right with that is one way of creating scarcity. Um, so on the kind of dependency conversation, Open Collective and the Open Source Collective, like it's all about project directed funding. So our approach to this is related to that. So we build a tool called Back Your Stack, for example, that lets you have a subscription um, and then we distribute amongst all your dependencies on Open Collective. Right. Um, so we just make it easier for companies instead of let, telling you, because you're right, there's a lot of opacity, right? Instead of expecting the company to do the work of like, Ooh, who is my dependency? And from those who want funding, because not everyone is asking for funding, not everyone should. 
um, you know, we do that work. So we have like a subscription model that we distribute. Um, and another um, experiment that we ran was with um, the NPM kind of, I don't know if you saw the, that we, we used to post after you download a package, uh, it, you used to say that they were an open collective and, um, and, but then so many packages, it was just like a spam machine. So we killed it. Um, but again, like it, it, you're right, right? Our efforts are, you know, towards how can we make it visible that this dependency, not only you're using it, but they are actually asking for funding, right? Because those two things uh, you need to know. Um, right. Yeah. But I guess, I guess, and this goes back to what Luis was saying at the start, is is it just asking for funding is creating this kind of a charity frame, a, a, a philanthropy frame for funding open source. Um, whereas I guess it's important to kind of to surface value and to surface what is the value proposition. What yeah. are you getting for that funding? I agree. I think that Tidelift is doing um, this in a much more, um, I guess, corporate kind of way, you know, this is what you get, you pay for this, this is what we consider to be a secure software, you know, this is what we consider to be like a good soft open source, you know, piece of software that you can use. This is why, you know, give us money, we'll give money. So, um, and, 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 and I think that's like, it makes a, a ton of sense. Like our approach has much more to do with um, less tangible kind of corporate, like, Prop, value prop that has to do with, you know, hiring, for example. Trivago saw their hiring completely change when they started investing seriously in Webpack. They had engineers applying because they knew that they were investing in open source in Webpack or Babel and Preact, right? And they were literally saying this in the applications. Um, you know, employee retention and happiness, right? You are, you if Airbnb wants to hire developers that know a certain piece of software and they want to hire from that community, they better invest in that community, right? Or for example, um, Vercel, right? Who, full disclosure, uh, the founder of Vercel is one of our investors, but like Vercel, um, they have access, because they have all of these subscriptions, they have access to knowing you know, ahead of time, the roadmap of these projects, if they're going to have breaking points in the future, you know, how is the, the project being, you know, steered or what direction for them, that's like access to all of this brain power that they wouldn't necessarily be able to hire. So our value prop to companies has much more to do with these intangibles than with that concrete kind of buy this, get this, this is secure. Um, right. I think the ecosystem needs both things and i've always been a very big advocate of this um i don't think there is one solution to sustaining open source i think that's ridiculous i think that each community each language each country you know they have their own kind of way of doing things and things that are going to work more for a certain language than another one or a certain type of project like you were saying the top the middle you know the bottom of the stack um and and so you know multiple approaches are needed um do you, do you yeah, work with maintainers on crafting their their kind of value proposition or the way that they argue for funding? Yeah, we do. We work with them a lot for this. And so part of the role of the open source collective, besides just being you know a fiscal sponsor and holding of, of, of the funds and distributing funds to the community, um, we are also, like our role is to be these advocates for this type of project directed funding. So we sit down with, you know, companies and we tell them, hey, this is like, you know, why you should be investing in your open source stack. This is how we think, you know, right. you should be thinking about this. And and so we have, you know, pretty large funds currently that are like, you know, we have Chrome that is coming up to a million dollars investing with us with open source collective has raised $15 million for open source. Right, and we did that by like kind of com talking to companies. Obviously, the projects do their fundraising. I'm not saying this is all open source collective, but I think that the combination of maintainers um, putting themselves also out there or asking us to kind of advocate on their behalf and making those connections, I think that a very important role that we have in the ecosystem is holding a space for those conversations to take place. Right, um, so, so yeah. 
So how do you walk that tightrope tight rope between, like I remember when Heartbleed uh, came out as an SSL vulnerability. Um, there was a period when uh, the maintainer of um, OpenSSL or one of the maintainers of OpenSSL said, I have a fix to this issue, um, but I'm not going to release it until I get paid. Um, that's my recollection, and I may be, I may be being unfair to the to the person in question. Uh, but the, my recollection was that there was a kind of a, a period where it was like, you need to be aware that I'm, you know, making twenty thousand dollars a year, um, mm -hmm. working full time on OpenSSH and OpenSSL, um, and that was the kind of the founding uh, impetus behind the critical infrastructure initiative at the Linux Foundation, as far uh, at, at the time, but. Uh, how do you walk that tightrope between you're asking me to do something which I wouldn't otherwise do, and therefore you should, you know, uh, compensate me for that, and I'm going to use my my position as a maintainer to be a, a kind of a to create a kind of a ransomware type situation where I'm not going to do things that I should be doing that I know I should be doing uh, until you give me money. How do how do you frame that conversation differently? I am not aware of any maintainer right now that I know of that is putting its open source project for ransom. Um, but maybe that's me, but I don't think that is very common. Um, I guess part of the beauty of doing something open source and having a community is people to use it. And I don't think that's a very common practice, but I might be I'm an optimist at heart, so who knows? Um, there is a really cool um, project called Sponsorware. I don't know if you know it of, but essentially Sponsorware is a project that says, we are building this, it's gonna be closed until we have enough people paying for it to compensate our time. And then we are gonna open up the, the project after we, you know, we get our initial or some X amount of money. So it's kind of, I really like that idea of almost like releasing a code, you know, freeing a code um, by actually compensating the people who build it, right? So you have sponsors, sponsors have access to the code. Once, you know, a certain threshold is met, then it's opened up to everyone. I think that it's a really interesting model for, for building a product that will be open, people will be able to use, but maintainers will be, uh, compensated for. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, so one, I never heard of sponsorware. I think it's actually really great that I've never heard of sponsorware. Uh, it, it, that like, it's actually, I'm sure Pia will agree, uh, it's a very exciting time to be, like when Pia and I started, because Open Collective is what, like four and a half, five years old now? Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's in fact uh, exactly four years old today for Tidelift from its corporate formation, and uh, which I had totally forgotten about, but was reminded of in Slack this morning. Um, like, I think when we started, there was less, there was talk about this, but there was not yet a lot of experimentation. Yeah. And there is currently a ton of, exp like we were on the, we were, we were on sort of a little bit the cutting edge of what has now become a very big wave of experimentation. And I always tell people like, look, if Tidal, I, you know, obviously I really hope Tidal succeeds, um, but like I am not, I'm much less worried about the overall state of the ecosystem because there's so much experimentation going on. Uh, so I think that's great. Um, and I want to, many things that I will probably say today probably sound negative and frustrated and all that, but like I think overall I'm like Pia, very much an optimist, uh, at least as much as an optimist as lawyers are allowed to be. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, but the, um, what was the other thing that I was going to say there in response to that? Um, oh, I, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, so, uh, so come back to me. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do want to talk about the, um, we've talked a lot about how to raise money for open source and how to justify um, that investment. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really talked about how does that decision get made? Which projects should get money? Uh, who makes that decision? And in those projects, and this is something that's been definitely a problem, uh, Luis, you will remember back in the day when GNOME was, try was decided to hire people to do some basic maintainer work, is like, who gets paid? 
Um, mm. When you've got a large community and you end up getting, you know, fifty thousand dollars, well, there's only so much that you can do with fifty thousand dollars when you're talking about salary. Um, you know, maybe in some countries that will hire two people full time. Uh, in most countries, that's not well. Uh, certainly in the U.S., that's not even a full time wage for for most parts of the U.S. If you're in California or in New York or Boston area, um, so. Once you get money for a community, um, what what role do you play in deciding which projects get what, and how do you end up identifying you know which are the which are the critical pieces of software that have real hard um, maintainer uh, maintainability issues, and which are the pieces of software like uh, you know we could talk about React as as a, an example of a piece of software that has a large comp, uh, corporation that pays employees to work on it, so we don't need to worry about React, but React's dependencies we do. Um, that kind of thing. So how do you, like, how does that money get distributed in a way that, which is equitable, um, efficient? Um, I mean, so we, I mean, we use dependency analysis of what our customers are actually using. Like there's no, there, there's, there's not, uh, so, so, well, two parts, right? So that's on a project basis, right? We see from what our customers are using, we see what projects they're using money goes to those projects. On a per project basis, I think, again, we've all been a little bit, um, most of these middle projects are actually not that complicated from a personnel perspective. It is pretty clear who the maintainer is, uh, pretty clear who's, who's in charge, right? So we are all used to a little uh, overthinking this, right? For, for not bad reasons, right? Like, because in fact, we deal with like CNCF is complex for a reason, um, but like, but CNCF is not the modal open source project, right? And so I think like that was actually something that worried me a lot when we started Tidelift was like, how are we gonna deal with this kinds of, and it turns out that for most projects, it's actually very obvious uh, and the projects can mostly settle it themselves. And then how do you ensure that that software does actually sus uh, enable sustainability? Um, like that, 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 what is the SLA, if you like, when, when I, as like, if I'm as a user of software giving for my usage, $50 to Tidelift or a hundred dollars or, mm -hmm. but I don't know how much your, your, your median um, deal uh, is. And it's more than that. <laughs> but as a, as a, like, if I'm a, let's say I'm a web agency deploying, yeah. uh, Vue.js websites to my customers, and I want to make sure that I'm supporting the Vue.js community. Um, it's going to be a relatively small amount of money. It's not going to pay somebody salary. Otherwise, I would potentially maybe consider paying somebody salary. Um, so how do you, how do I know that my thousand or two thousand dollars will help Vue.js be sustained? I mean, partially just power in numbers, right? Your like your money is bundled with uh, money from a lot of other customers. So yes, it's split up across many projects, but uh, it's also combined with many other uh, sources of funding, right? So that's the, I think that's the big. You know, you spoke about SLAs. I think the other dirty secret of all this is people don't actually use their SLAs very much, uh, and so there's like a, a little bit of. Um, it, it, we've actually found that there's a lot of flexibility around what both what maintainers are willing to do and what customers actually need uh, from a lot of this. Uh, I wish we had a better name for it than middle, like actually, you know, um, I, I was sort of hoping we'd have a like big furious fight about what it means, what, you know, how we define those tops and bottoms. Because, you know, you push back on Kubernetes. I still don't have a great, I have diagrams, I have slides, but I don't have a great like word label for it. Um, so, uh, so yeah. From from my perspective, that's that's a that's a difficult issue because um, we our mission is to support communities, not to support individual maintainers. So we are we are not opinionated at all on about how a community or a project decides how to spend their money. Like we don't get involved in, we ha we're very opinionated in terms of the transparency, like everything in Open Collective is transparent by design, which helps 
towards you know the question of how do i know my money is being spent on this right because a project can spend their money on on things that are not um going towards uh, their mission and we know that we do the compliance we are their fiscal sponsor so we kind of approve um expenses right um but if they decide to pay all their money to a maintainer or to or we have projects that don't pay for time they just pay for community stuff like they would pay for people to come together for a sprint they would pay for you know um hardware to use or the software costs or whatever it is right but we don't get very involved in how these communities um decide how to spend their money we treat them as independent organizations we want to kind of treat them as their own thing right that's important to us that said it's a problematic stand sometimes right because think about it you are bubble right you're henry or nicola or any of the bubble guys now and they they are going through hell right because of you know the comments unfortunate comments of the former you know bubble author or one of he's always the author by the football uh, maintainer and um um and so you are putting we are open collective or open source collective we're putting a lot of stress on already pre-stressed out communities right the stress of having to decide how to manage money right it's not it's not easy um i think the solution to that is not not to give them money is to help them manage their governance better so we do this in a very soft way. Um, so we, you know, talk to them a lot. We hold spaces. We, we, you know, we support the maintainers. We had at one point even like a almost like a maintainer rehab kind of um, standing call for folks who were like burning out and you know having a hard time managing this. Um, what we want to do ultimately is to build healthy, resilient, thriving communities. And in order to do that, you cannot treat um, an open source, like just code or, you know, something that others are using. You need to treat it as a community, as a, a more holistic kind of approach to it. That's, that's our approach. And so, um, we, you know, we encourage, um, projects to spend their money on, you know, soft skills, right? Like, you know, get a documentation, you know, get a technical writer, get someone to help you triage issues. You know, we value, um, um, contributions, code and non-code contributions in the same way. Get someone to do it, you know, pay for someone to do a good design, but, you know, so get a facilitator for your sprint. Those kind of things, um, we encourage them a lot on how to spend the money. That doesn't solve the problem of, of how to decide who gets what. Um, and I've seen, and we can go into detail about this because everything is transparent, but I've seen different projects deciding different ways from a classic you know, we get X a month, there's three of us, we divide X by three each month, and that's it, right? To, you know, we're gonna pay a full-time maintainer and to have, you know, part-time maintainers to, we are never, never, never paying for code. We're only paying for soft things for the community. Would you, do you have a, 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 a preference, an opinion on, on which is the right, um, or which is the best way? Do you encourage developers to consider spending smaller amounts of money on, Kind of unpleasant tasks like book triage and documentation yeah we i mean i don't have a preference i we try to encourage them to spend on their community so kind of community gardening kind of stuff um because we understand that maintaining a project is also about getting other people to support you know maintenance right. and um, and so we encourage them to spend time on how do you onboard new developers? How do you write your docs for this? You know, pay for someone to come and write your docs for that. So we do. Um, but we also, our, you know, our dream is to make it, to make working for your community as attractive as it is working for a corporation in terms of salary, right? That's what we want to see, right? So, so at the end of the day, we, can, we want to get more people getting paid by their community okay yeah very much on the same you know i think that encapsulates so much of uh the you know the the goal here right is that we we think all of this will be healthier um you know, this is a little bit of a long-running dispute i have with uh pia smart and just stays off twitter as far as i can tell mostly um <laughs> since i'm an idiot uh i'm on twitter too much 
And uh, one of the things that I, there's this occasional discussion of, uh, the best way to make open source sustainable is to have corporations hire a lot of people. And I just don't, that is fine for certain kinds of projects. As we were saying earlier, there are going to be lots of different solutions for different communities, different technologies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I just don't see that as the right end game for a lot of healthy communities, right? I think the healthiest communities are going to be ones that at least have at least part of their uh, core staffing in a, in a, in a independent in some kind of way. Um, and that might be through a foundation. It might be through, uh, you know, through Tidelift or through Open Collective. But that's very much the goal is that kind of independence. But the difficulty, you know, with that argument, um, going back to Ostrom is that no, no individual actor, no individual corporation has, uh, has the motivation to hire somebody to maintain Libsy. You know, that there's no, there's no financial uh, argument that you can make that says that, you know, we, we should invest a hundred thousand dollars or $200,000 in, in hiring somebody to be a software engineer. Co companies. So one companies do irrational things all the time. Part <laughs> of the, the, one of the takeaways from Ostrom is, is that you can, is that collective action problems are solvable, right? Yes. Like you, you can with see Ostrom action, with, with collective action, right? And collective action can take many forms. It can be through social shaming. It can be through social, I mean, you know, I think one of the things that this is actually the, the point where I said I lost my train of thought was that this is an amazingly, overall, an amazingly optimistic and non-cynical, like to be involved in open source requires a certain amount of non-cynicism, right? And the balance has changed over time and it's different than the good old days of whatever, right? But like overall, it is a very, uh, you know, and I think we see this in the pushback, for example, against the commercial open source licenses in which you notice that neither of us have, you know, like that's not what we're trying to do with these. You, you could create scarcity that way, right? But that's not what we're trying to do. And uh, I, I hope I'm not speaking <laughs> out of turn for you here, Pia, but, um, you know, I, I think there's, a, there's an optimism there that solutions are possible as long as people are participating in good faith and part of how you create that good faith is it's a virtuous cycle, right? Like people will have good faith that this will work if there's reasons to be optimistic. Once there's reasons to be optimistic, there's good faith, right? And that, that cycle can go in reverse. It can be negative. Right. But like it's, uh, it, you know, it, I think overall, like we've managed to keep for 20 years a pretty amazingly positive uh vibe about this thing you know it helps to be in the fastest growing industry and the most important industry in the world yada 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 right but like um i mean other than carbon extraction which is uh, you know another chat for another time so i feel guilty that one of the topics that i wanted to talk about we won't have time i feel like it's worthy of uh, a full episode on itself which is, uh, I did want to talk about maintainer burnout and how big an issue that is and what you do to allay that concern and, and to address that. Um, but it seems like we'll have to hold that conversation for another day. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you, Luis, and thank you, Pia, for joining me yeah. today. I'm going to give you give you the floor, each of you, for, for, a, for a minute to wrap up. Like, what, if, Do you have anything that you'd like to add to the conversation that we've had today so far, Pia? Uh, no, um, I'm good. Thank you for having me. And, um, you know, thank you for holding this space. Um, the only way forward is through it. So, you know, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll just reiterate the one thing that I said earlier, which is that this is an amazing time of experimentation. And I'm really glad that I have seen Pia regularly on these kinds of things through the pandemic and um, you know, I, I think that's a very, uh, you know, like I said, I, I hope a lot of these flowers bloom and take root, and, and I think a lot of them will. So pretty excited about that. So thank you again both for joining me. Next week, we have episode 11 of our second season, so I'm adding episodes as we go along. Uh, I will be joined by Anil Lakani and Craig Kirsteens, who are experts in product marketing and uh product management and product development for startups specifically. They've, they've kind of made their, built their careers on joining early companies that have that have grown up around, around projects and, and uh, developing the product and product marketing teams in them. 
so we're going to talk about ramping up, uh, that inflection point that is so critical for, for startups uh, in general, but for open source startups as well, where you start to go from technology driven founders to adding product marketing and sales functions and how, how to manage that inflection point without losing some of your culture, how to design a go-to-market plan, um, how, to, uh, how to kind of prepare your company for scale. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a pretty interesting topic. And, and Anil and Craig are, are both uh, very much experts in the area. Um, and with that, thank you again, Pia and Luis, for joining me today. I hope to see you in the future. As I said, this will be going up onto YouTube. Are you both OK with this going up as Creative Commons uh, CC by, sure. um, okay. Thank you very much. Then it will be it will be on YouTube either later today or tomorrow, depending on when I get around to doing the the editing, which is unfortunately required due to our technical issue at the start. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, have a nice day. Goodbye. Hi.